I would like to talk to you a moment today <clears throat> about something someone was talking to me about recently. How that so many seems to think that God and the blessings of God and his mercies are just like a tool in their toolbox. When they need it, you go and use it. And when you're done, you put it away. <clears throat> There's a story in the book of Acts in the 8th chapter, and you go down to about the 18th verse. And it was talking about, in the previous verses, of the <clears throat> apostles being able to lay on hands of those who came to them, and they would see receive the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit would enter into them. And the power of the Holy Spirit was something to be desired. It's something to be desired today. And Simon, one of the local magicians, came up to the apostles and he said, let me purchase this, this great power that you have. Show me how, you, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, show me how to acquire this thing. I'll pay you whatever amount that you desire. I want to buy it. Peter responded, it's not for sale. You can't buy this power. And he went further and he said, repent, because I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness. Today, and I suspect that it's been this way throughout history, but it's certainly very noticeable today. The people who are in the gall of bitterness. Bitterness is, is the, just seems to ride with them as if they can't recognize anything good anymore. And then when they find that the bitterness leads to hate, which by the way, bitterness, if one doesn't repent, and to repent means to turn and go the other way. It means to seek forgiveness and turn and go the other way. So if they don't repent of that bitterness and clean that out of their heart and their life, the result of bitterness has always been the same. It's always been the same. It results in hate. And there is no room in the heart of God's people for bitterness and hate. There never has been. There isn't now. But what so often happens is, is that people allow this bitterness to grow and grow and grow until it turns into hate. And then they hit a, a calamity in their life. Someone becomes sick. This present time, it could well be the virus. It could be the flu. It could be cancer. But they become deathly ill. And they immediately turn to God. And they repent. God, I'm sorry for my sins. If you'll do this for me, or you'll do that for me, God, I know that you'll, you'll hear me. And I'm sorry for my sins. And I will serve you faithfully. I won't go back and do those things again. God gives them what they ask for. He serves the purpose. And then they return right back to the way they were. Oh, they might last a week, two, a month. But then soon they're right back doing exactly what they were doing before. I've said this before, and a lot of people don't like this, especially a lot of my Baptist friends don't like this, because within the Baptist religious world, for the most part, you're taught that the minute you go to an altar or you make an altar at home and you kneel down and you pray and you say, God, forgive me 
from my sins, he immediately fills you with the Holy Ghost. I don't agree with that. I don't believe that's what the Bible actually teaches. What I believe the Bible actually teaches is, is that God immediately forgives you for your sin and the Holy Spirit washes you clean of your sins, makes you white as snow. And you start out as a baby and you start to grow in the things of the Lord. And I'm going to sound a little bit Methodist here who believe in a second definite work of grace. A little bit like the Pentecostals who believe that uh, they reach, you reach a point where you seek after the Holy Ghost. Because I believe just like in our carnal life, in our worldly life, we have to grow to a place of maturity. And then when we reach a place of maturity, things change. I'm not the same person I was when I was 16 years old. As I grew older, God began to reveal things to me, and I began to look at the past as lessons learned rather than things to be bitter about. <clears throat> so then I believe personally that we need to seek the face of God and ask him, to infill us with this divine love that will help us to overcome all things and keep us clean and pure and holy and Christ-like. You see, because love is what the Holy Spirit is. That is what it is. It is the spirit of love. When you're a child, you have the rudiments of love but other things come in and it interferes with it. And that's what happens in our spiritual life. We struggle with that. You say, well, what makes you believe that? The Bible talks about that there was a man who cleaned his house. He garnished it, cleaned it, got it, got it completely um, ready, perfectly clean. But he said, Jesus said that if the good man of the house left the house empty then soon it would become dirty and filthy again and it would be actually worse than what it was in its beginning and that typically is what happens to backsliders people who don't get filled with the Holy Spirit when you get filled with the Holy Spirit though you're letting the good man of the house is letting in someone who comes in and works within you it's kind of like having maid service that keeps the inside of your heart and your life pure and clean. I was talking to someone just the other night, and we were discussing this to some length, that in this day of a lot of negative politics, whether you're on the right or you're on the left, being in the center of the road is a very difficult place to be right now. And it's okay to have different opinions and different views, to like a different candidate versus another one. It's all right to, I would hope, have good reason for whatever choice that you make. But I'll tell you what's not all right. It's not all right to have the bitterness and the hate and always look through things through a dark lens, to always see it as the evil without even researching. People jump to way, way too many conclusions. They listen to too much gossip. They listen to too much fake media, and there is fake media. And they don't research. Um, I've often said about studying the Bible, if you base your religious view on one single verse, you're probably wrong. If you find a verse that confirms something you can believe, and it was actually taught by Christ, you'll usually find it multiple times. Now, it might be worded different in the other places, but it confirms and still teaches the same message. So, 
any time that we are seeking to find the right answers, there should be confirmation from more than one place. And the first place to look is toward the Holy Spirit. Those of us who have our hearts changed to a heart of love and caring, the very first place to go is to the Holy Spirit. Because if a position, if something that you're about to do or say is not bringing about good or not speaking <coughs> out of love, but it's speaking out of bitterness, then I can tell you, you don't have to search any farther. You're wrong. You're wrong. What you just said, what you just did, is simply wrong. If what you said is out of love and you or what you did is an action to bring about good, then you did the right thing and you'll be blessed for that. Yesterday, um, one of the little boys that Katie keeps threw a rock and hit his brother in the back of the head. And, um, as I got on to him and I said to him, I just, I can't believe you did that. That, that that's how little that you love your brother. I love my brother. Then why would you throw a rock and hit him in the back of the head? And then I, he was, Katie had told him to go down and pick up the rocks that he had threw down in the lawn. And I sat there with him as he did that. And then I said, I want you to listen to me for a minute. You know who Jesus is. Yes, you love to sing his songs. Yes. Do you know that Jesus said that what we are to do is to do good one to another? Today, we live in a time where there is an awful lot of stone throwing, hitting people that we claim to love and that we care about. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? These are supposed to be friends. These are supposed to be family members. They're supposed to be people you care about. Even if you disagree with their opinion, you agree, disagree with the toy that they're playing with, or even if you'd like to have the toy, do you think you accomplish anything by throwing a stone? And then after you throw lots and lots of stones and you find yourself in a distressing situation, then you want to look up toward heaven and say, Oh, God, I'm so sorry for the sins that I've done. Come and fill me now with your power. Wash over me with your Holy Spirit and solve this problem. Like he's a tool in your toolbox. God's not a tool in your toolbox. He's not like the wrench in my tool belt or my wire cutters or my needle nose pliers. A relationship with God is what we have. God is my father. His son, Jesus Christ, is my brother. Why would I desire to hurt them? Why would I stone them? Yet every time that we allow ourselves to do something that is harmful, evil, bad, we're stoning Christ. We're stoning God. And we've pushed the Holy Ghost right out the front door of our heart and our life. I said to someone, as I was saying, I had a talk with someone the other night, and we were talking about this. There is so much bitterness, so much hate, and so many ridiculous, stupid, unfounded things being said by people. It is hard not to not only get angry, 
but to let that anger turn into bitterness that would lead to hate. And you say, well, why does that happen? It happens because we see so much animosity coming from so many different directions. And I find with myself, people that I used to respect, I have a hard time respecting now. Because I see so much anger and bitterness and quite frankly, untruths that are coming from them. Hypocrisy that is coming from them. That they've changed. They're not the people that they used to be. People that I thought were loving are not very loving. They're not very caring. They seem to only care about their little box. Their little box. And if you're outside that box, well, we don't really care about you. Some people think that because they go to church, and during this pandemic where we've been asked not to get into big crowds, but if we go to church where it is still been approved, You've been asked to wear a face mask and do social distancing. And I've heard people say, oh, but we believe God will protect us. He'll protect us. He'll throw his divine hands down and we can't be harmed. If you really believe that, then why don't you walk into a burning building? Why do you have smoke detectors in your house? Why do you stop at railroad crossings? Why do we obey have speed limits? Why would you just go into a place that's full of children with measles and take your child into a place full of measles? You wouldn't do that or chicken pox. God gave us brains common sense and this isn't an infringement upon religious worship what it's saying is is there are many ways to worship God and to worship them wisely we don't buy God's grace by going to church hear me now we don't buy God's Holy Spirit by going to church we don't buy his power we don't buy, buy his divine goodness. You get that freely from God. When Jesus said, when you keep my commandments, and he said, my commandments are really simple, to love God and to love one another. That's what protects you. That's what makes the tool a usable good tool in the toolbox because you have a relationship with God and you can talk to God 10 times a day 100 times a day you know Paul and Silas was put into prison they certainly wasn't attending church while they were in prison but they lifted up hands and they began to sing and the chains fell off of them and the jail doors swung open. Do a little research. How many people did Jesus heal as he walked along the street versus how many he healed inside the temple? You're going to find not many inside the temple but many in people's homes, many in people's homes, many on the street. Some think because I give a big offering, I make good money, I pay my tithes, my paying my tithes and then giving a gift, which is the offering on top of that, will somehow buy me the power of God. It does not buy you the power of the Holy Ghost. The power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost comes because you love God, you love Christ, and you love 
one another and you do good. At one point, the disciples were asked to heal someone and they couldn't do it. And when they couldn't do it, Jesus responded to them, these things come by prayer and fasting. He didn't say it comes by risking your brothers and sisters' lives and their families' lives and the ungodly and the sinners that might be there are the ones that they might be going home to. You know, I've attended church most of my entire life. And there's always some wives who come to church with their kids, but their husbands don't go. Sometimes it's the other way around. It's husbands that go, the wives don't go. And the wife or the husband, the spouse, believes that through prayer and faithfulness of going to church and their ungodly spouse or their backslidden spouse will see a change in their life and will want what they have to and come to the Lord. And they're right if a change is made. But if going to church doesn't bring about a change in how you think and how you act and how you talk and what you do, then you might as well go to the drive-in. I have someone that I care a great deal about, and they've struggled with this, whether or not to go to the church because people are shaming them because well, we believe God will keep you safe. You should come to church. You're lacking in faith. And that person believes very clearly in what Paul taught, that we should obey the instructions and the rightful laws of leaders if they are for our good and our safekeeping. And they are right. They're right. Jesus said, don't tempt the Lord thy God. Which one of you are willing to let me tempt you and test you and let me see if you really have the Holy Ghost? Let me throw you a couple of timber rattlers and let's see if you're willing to grab them and let them bite you. Come on, most of you aren't that foolish. Most of you aren't. Though I've been to a church that they did come out with a basket of snakes and throw it out there in the group of people. And I'm going to tell you something. I knew my heart was right with God and I love God, but I ain't staying up there playing with no snakes. I hit that back door as fast as I didn't know I could move that fast. Let me tell you, God is not bought by your tithes and offerings, nor your church attendance. And God isn't bought by your occasional doing good. Oh, I'll give to the food pantry that leftover canned stuff that I got that I'm never going to use. I'm, I, oh, there's somebody over here, and they're hungry, and, and they're taking up a little neighborhood collection, so I'll carry them a bag of groceries. That doesn't redeem you for all the bitterness and the evil and the gossip and the hate that you spew. It's a good thing that you're doing. But it's not good actions that save your soul. You say, I believe it's not just setting and believing either. Paul made it very clear in the discussion about faith. He said, faith without works is dead. What good is it for me to say that I have faith, but I have no works? Or what good is it for me to have an abundance of works and I have no faith? It's a combination of things. The power of God working within us to change us, to make us good. 
You all know the story of the boy who cried wolf, right? The boy lived out in a little, a little village. His job was to take care of the sheep. And in the village, one little shepherd would go out each day, take the sheep out. And this was this boy's particular job. And he was bored. He was bored. A lot of you get bored, so then you drift away to doing wrong things. He was bored, and he thought it would be funny to, to get some excitement. And he came running into town, and he yelled, Woof, woof! All the men in town, they dropped their, their, their rakes and their hoes and their plows. They quit picking the cotton, whatever they were doing, and they ran with their with their spears and their knives and their guns to kill the wolf and there was no wolf. And the boy just laughed his head off. Townspeople weren't too happy with that. God's not too happy with that either. When you go to him and you say, Lord, I will do this for you if you will do this for me. And then he does it and you sit out there and laugh at him. I made a fool out of you, God. <laughs> I cried, woof, you came to my rescue. Uh-uh. But the boy didn't stop there. He did it a second time, and he did it a third time. And when he did it the third time, there was really the woof. The woof was there. And the village people, when he ran into town yelling, woof, woof, nobody listened. God is no different. He's not a bargaining chip. He's not a tool that you can play with and say, okay, I'll make you this promise, but I won't keep it. There were a man and wife in the early church named Ananias and Sapphira. And I told you in a few videos back, I would, I would bring this story up. And I'm going to now. In the early days of the church, the church was not in some designated building. And you know what? For all of you who hate the idea of socialism, it was organized as a very socialist thing. And what the people who were born again Christians agreed to do is they'd take all of their goods, whatever they had, and they'd bring it into the church They'd even sell their, their access land that they had, and they'd bring it into the church, and the church leaders would divide it so that no person went hungry and no person went without, and no person was up here while somebody else was down here. And I, Ananias and Sapphira, they said to the church, oh, we have some land, and we'll sell it. We'll sell it. They were in the, they were in the spirit of doing good. Boy, I've seen a lot of people in the spirit of doing good. Oh, I'll donate $100 to the church building fund. Have a revival. I'll pay the first $200 for the evangelist. Buy a church bus. I'll help you buy it. You can count on me and my tithes and my offerings. Put in an air conditioner. I'll give money toward it. Heal my sick child, God. And I'll never miss a Sunday morning service again. Oh, I'm voting for you for pastor because I love the sermon that, that you preach and the few sermons that you've come and you visited our church. And I'm going to be here to support you and back you until the first sermon he preaches that gets on your toes, that talks about your sin. Ananias and Sapphira in the happy moment when all was going well and they were rejoicing in the power of the Holy Ghost they said we've got this land over here we're going to sell it and we're going to give the proceeds to the church so that the needy can be taken care of they sold the land but then they hid the money and instead of giving it to the church, and instead of giving it to the apostles to go out and to feed and to take care of everyone 
and give everybody and bring them to equals, they hid their money and it cost them their life. God held them accountable that day. That day. That day they went to meet the Lord because they lied to God. You go to an altar or you make an altar or you got some place and you prayed and you said, God, forgive me for my sins. I love you. I want to be your child. I want to be a part of your family. I want to do good. And he forgave you your sins. He wiped them all away. And you serve him for a little while. And as you start to grow, you get carried away with... Oh, well, that isn't right. This leader isn't doing the right thing. That church member's not doing the right thing. That pastor, I don't know what's gotten into him. He's, he's preaching about all the things that I think are okay. And the next thing you know, with each bitter word, each time that you're out there on the phone gossiping or you're going and you're saying to somebody I can't stand the way that you think or you look at that passage of scripture you're just wrong I'll prove that you're wrong I'm going to beat you up with the Bible you march down the aisle saying an onward Christian soldiers marching as to war what war are you marching against Paul told you to take the whole armor of God and the sword, his word, to use it as a defense, not a tool to attack. We're to get bread, a bread that people will never hunger again. We're to get water, a water that they'll never thirst again. And that is love. If we can bring them in to eat at the table, God's table, and drink the wine of his blood and be filled with love, we don't have to go out there, I'm, I'm going to fight you with my sword because I've got a shield of faith. And then you're defeated. And then you wonder why you're sitting there feeling angry and depressed and mad and nobody likes you and you can't stand anybody at the church anymore and you can't stand, frankly, you can't stand any of your family and you look in the mirror and you can't stand yourself. Co-workers don't like you. All you ever do when you work with them is gripe and complain, gripe and complain. All you ever do is get angry that restaurant that hotel's never good enough the rental car is not good enough the factory is hot it's dirty gripe and complain what do you say I'm onward Christian soldiers When did you join the wrong army? What caused you to join the wrong army? Our war is not in condemning other people and wanting to take their spiritual well-being and destroying it. Our war is against the devil, against sin, against wrongdoing, against hurting people. That's wrongdoing. Our war is against lying and stealing and abuse, negligence. Our gift is to love and do good, even to our enemies, even to those that despitefully use us. And when we find the carnal side of us, the human side getting angry, 
we get on our knees and we say, God, I don't understand. I don't understand these people. But give me the wisdom to bring them into remembrance that they're my brother. They're my sister. They're your child. I preach against sin not to condemn anyone but that they might examine themselves and condemn themselves and come to the Lord to get it right. To get it right. While you have breath, you have hope. You can't buy God's goodness. You can't do anything to deserve the blood that was shed for you on the cross of Calvary to cleanse you from sin. You can't pay a sacrifice big enough, not your life, not your family's life, because Christ was that sacrifice given by God. All you have to do is accept it. See, the Holy Ghost couldn't be bought by money because it was free. There's a passage of scripture in the Old Testament, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah, where he says, come and eat and drink without cost. Because what God's blessings are, are free. It's a food pantry you can come to every day of the week, a dozen times. You can get all your snacks right there. And all you've got to do to get in to God's little pantry is love. How's that little chorus go that we used to sing at Brother I Chorus Church? Sung it in so many services. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. And with joy, my King, and what you hear. And I just messed up. May you find a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I missed the word there. Doesn't matter but it's because I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. I speak out because I care about you. Someone asked me the other day, and I will tell this as I'm getting ready to close. I mean, I'm going to make this shorter, I think, today, as I get ready to close. Someone asked me the other day, said, why is it you know that this aunt, this uncle, these cousins, these people, all are on the other side of the fence than you are politically. They get kind of mad at you because you take the position you do. And I said, I am sorry that they've become so delusional that they've lost sight of what is good for them and good for this nation. That they believe that someone else is going to take care of them. Let me tell you a secret. No president, no Congress is going to take care of you. But Jesus will. God will. The Holy Spirit will. I had to go in to file my unemployment today. Unfortunately, they're making me completely redo the full certification all over again. I don't know why, but that's what they're doing. That means that I'll go for a week or maybe two weeks with no unemployment check. And my first thought was, oh, Lord, I've got bills. <laughs> Lots of bills. And then I thought, what am I worried about it for? I've made it through much, much worse times. 
And God has always taken care of me, and he will now. And he will now. Someone that I love and care about said, do you need anything? Do you need some help? If you need something, tell me. I said, no, I'll be fine. I've never asked people for help. God will take care of me. He always has, and he always will. You know why? Because I care about others, and I do my best to do good. And sometimes I fall short. And if I have ever hurt you or failed to meet a need that I could to help you, I beg your forgiveness. Because I've never sought to do anything but good. I fight for your social security because I love you. I fight for your social networks that will protect you when you're unemployed or without a job for whatever the reason. Because I love you. And I know you have to eat a carnal food as well as spiritual food. I fight for you about this virus because I care about you. I don't want you shortening your days on the earth because of your careless actions are shortening the days on this earth of other people that I love. I care about you. I write my post knowing that some of you are going to be bitter, some of you are going to be angry, some of you are going to spit back in my face. But I do it because I love you. I've been preaching. I was ordained at the age of 16, licensed at the age of 15. And I have been preaching all these years, not because I got some big reward. Do you know out of over 20 plus years of working in the pastorate, I was only paid probably four, maybe five of those. I never received any income the rest of those. Why? Why? Why did I always turn down full-time pastorates where the church wanted to pay me? Because I don't work for the people. I don't work for you. I work for God. My job is to preach the word of God. And you're not going to tell me what to preach. You're not going to tell me what to teach. You're not going to tell me what to fight for and what to believe in and what to defend because I will defend poor people. I will defend working poor people. I will defend the aged. I will defend Christians. And the rest of you I'll pray for and I'll do good to no matter what you've done to me. And I will love you. Even though it takes a lot of work on my half to love you. Because some of you right now aren't very lovable. A young man who was very angry at me for a time hugged me the other night and he says, I love you. That's what I do it for. It's to reach people's hearts. And some will love me but it's not important whether you love me as much as it is. It's that you love the Lord. Because if you love the Lord, then you will love me. <laughs> if you don't love the Lord, you're probably angry at me. And then you need to have a little talk with Jesus. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He can hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Now feel a little fire will burning. Let's have a little talk with Jesus. I'm praying for you whether you're praying for me or not. And believe it or not, if you think I'm all that wrong, and God has been laying me down the wrong road, or I've gone astray, and I'm not hearing God's voice, but I know God's voice and someday if you want to know what God's voice sounds like, you come talk to me and I'll explain it to you. I know the voice of God. He's been talking to me a long time. 
don't give me the answers that I want to hear. I'd like to know what the lottery numbers are going to be. But he's never told me that. But I can tell you this. I know the voice of God. And you can know it too. May God bless you.